This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. All this week, Bloomberg Television and Radio are on the ground in Boston showcasing tech giants and startups, plus breakthrough technologies in the fields of biotech and robotics. We're speaking with innovators, venture capitalists, and educators who have laid roots all across the city. And we've got developing news as well on Snapchat. Shares have gone off a cliff after the first earnings report as a public company. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But first, to Caroline Hyde, who joins us now from the Harvard Innovation Lab. In in Boston. Caroline, tell us what you got coming up this show. Emily, quite amazing. Through here, more than 800 companies have been incubated. I want to know the success stories. We want to talk to really about the verticals, the area of tech that they're focusing on. And also, a man I cannot wait to speak to, someone who has helped fund the Life Lab here at Harvard, Steve Pagliuca. He knows a thing about tech. He also knows a fair thing about sport as co-owner, of course, of the Boston Celtics, Emily. All right, Caroline, stay with me. I want to dive into Snap's first quarterly earnings report as a publicly traded company. Shares of Snapchat's parent company now plunging in after hours, trading down as much as 25%. What has Wall Street investors so concerned? Well, revenue coming in at almost $150 million, missing estimates by nearly $10 million. Snap reporting 166 million daily active users, also trailing Wall Street expectations. Uh, so are the copycat moves by the likes of Instagram, and Facebook taking a toll. Joining us now from New York, James Chalkmock of Monas, Crespi, and Hart. Uh, so, James, a lot to digest yeah. here. International growth flat across three quarters in a row now. Two billion dollars in stock-based compensation. You've been very positive on Snap. What went wrong here? Yeah, we've been positive. We have been giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, I will say, look, the the user number I think was okay. Uh, and the issue there is uh, not so much. Uh, I think the bigger uh, concern is on the monetization side. ARPU did fall 15% sequentially to 90 cents. That is where the street was, uh, but you did want to see outperformance uh, as far as that metric is concerned. And you put that together, you get to a revenue number of 150 million, 7 million below uh, consensus. And I think coming out of the gate, the, the issue coming into this quarter was the fact that you had a very difficult setup where expectations were sky high and the bias was incredibly toward the downside. So it really was a, a difficult uh, uh, you know, uh, performance for uh, the company to meet. Well, we've been listening in on the earnings call. Evan Spiegel, the CEO, has been speaking. He had this to, to say, take a listen, about ad revenue. We made significant progress in automating our advertising business this quarter with more than 20% of Snap ad impressions delivered programmatically through our API. Automating our ads platform means that advertisers get better pricing, our community sees better ads, and we are able to make more money per impression. Now, James, as we know, Facebook has basically lifted Snapchat stories and spread it across all the platforms from Facebook to Instagram to WhatsApp to Messenger. Snapchat stories are critical. This is where they display their ads. How concerned are you about the competition? Not so much yet. Um, I mean, look, the, the users are growing at a healthy rate. Uh, and, and engagement is growing. You know, we also learned on this call that engagement time spent has gone north of 30 minutes per day. You know, that's a very sizable number. You know, peg that against uh, Facebook properties, 50 minutes uh, across their portfolio of apps in aggregate. So, you know, their engagement is there. Uh, and I think the use cases are different, you know, when it comes to Snap, uh, as far as the messaging, the more rawness of the experience, as well as on the content side through their Discover platform. So I, I'm, I'm not looking at it as completely apples to apples, you know, with Instagram. And, and I think if you can see a situation where ARPU, which is the monetization per user, increases dramatically, because you, when you benchmark it against Facebook, it's only 10% of where Facebook is, it's 20% of where Twitter is. You're not telling me that it can't get to where Twitter is today? You know, so, so that's kind of the bull case for the stock. James, it's Caroline Hyde in sure. Boston. Great to have you with us. I remember the day that you came out with a buy <laughs> yeah. recommendation. You were one of the first to do so. Yeah. $25 a share, still seeming reasonable to you, despite the fact that we're plumbing well back to the depths of when the IPO priced at $17. I, I'm inclined to say it is right now, you know, just based on looking at the initial numbers and, and hearing what I am on the call as it relates to the user growth and it relates to the time spent. 
monetization is a question that I that we need to do drill drilled a little bit further on. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate that we're not getting any more clarity quantitatively on the uh, the financial outlook as we look into 2Q and for the year. They're kind of uh, pinning that on a our growth is going to be stemming from the the timing of our product rollouts. Uh, so a lot of questions there's a lot more explaining to do that you know we would like to see but at least you know the users and the engagement are going in the right direction so still giving the benefit of the doubt as you said at the start of the call i, I just want to ask more broadly a question yeah. about ipos and how this reflects on it because axios we've already heard from dan primark saying this could cause a bit of a cloud around mm -hmm. ipos internet-based ipos going forward does this make perhaps the IPO, ipo pipeline a little bit more worrying when we see this sort of first quarter revenue numbers coming out yeah i mean slightly um i mean look the ipo itself was a success i think you can argue that i think the issue was I mean, it's interesting because the expectations just got so high uh, with the sentiment so negative. You know, the most bearish people on the stock had the highest estimates. Uh, and you, when you talk to the buy side community, that was the case as well. So, I mean, it was a very difficult company, uh, a di very difficult setup to perform against because, you know, they had to do well beyond the rosiest of expectations in order to put the naysayers to rest. So I think it was kind of a lose-lose situation where I think that's a learning lesson that uh, other uh, potential IPOs can take. But the IPO itself, I think, you can argue was okay. All right. Well, Snapshare is now down almost 26% after yeah. hours. We're continuing right. to listen in uh, on that call, James. I know you'll be jumping on there. James yeah. Chalkmock, analyst at Monas, Crespi, and Hart. Thanks so much, Caroline. I'll send it back over to you in Boston. We'll continue to monitor the call and bring headlines as we have them. We will do, and whether we see any analyst changes, only six cells on this stock at the moment, Emily. But now let's bring it back to Boston, and we'll be speaking with none other than Bain Capital Managing Director and Boston Celtics co-owner Steve Paliuka. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from the Harvard University Innovation Lab. And Massachusetts, well, it leads the U.S. in venture capital investment for biotech, one big-time investor that is helping to feed the ecosystem in life sciences. It's Bain Capital Managing Director and Co-Chairman Steve Paliuka. And, of course, thanks to a hefty donation from Paliuka and his wife, the Paliuka Harvard Life Lab opened its doors last November. The Life Lab offers specialized equipment to a discount to incubate early-stage life sciences startups. And we got an inside peek at the incubator and looked at what they have in store. The Paliuka Harvard Life Lab is a 15,000-square-foot incubator intended to support Harvard-founded life sciences and biotech startups. Ventures like Vaxus Technologies, one of a handful of startups commercializing a silk biomaterial technology developed at nearby Tufts University. We start with the same silk material that's used in the textile industry. We basically pull one protein out of silk in solution format like this. We're essentially re-engineering the silk to encapsulate and protect that vaccine. As co-founder and CEO, Michael Schrader explains this small postage stamp-sized patch is really made of hundreds of vaccinated microneedles that are wrapped in a silk protein. It makes vaccines easier to administer and, more importantly, eliminates the need for refrigeration. It's small, it's compact, it's something that I could self-administer or administer to you much more easily. Um, and then secondarily, this patch is also shelf-stable, so we can ship it around the world without refrigeration, which is a major challenge uh, with a lot of the vaccines, actually all the vaccines on the market today. To remain effective, all vaccines need to be kept cold, from point of manufacturing to end patient. These silk-stabilized vaccines could make it cheaper and easier to vaccinate the developing world. The entire vaccine industry uh, right now, sales are, are in the roughly $30 billion range. And we've heard estimates of the, the burden of the cold chain anywhere in the four to $6 billion range, if you think of it from a global perspective. Uh, so the opportunity to go after that, reduce those costs, and also expand uh, access to these products is a pretty compelling goal for us. 
Founded in 2012 when Schrader was a student at Harvard, the startup has raised $13.5 million in funding, including grants from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help in the eradication of polio and measles. So Gates is funding us to basically develop a polio patch that is not only heat stable, compact, easier to administer, but also actually combines three separate doses into two patches so we can shorten that regimen that's needed to give to patients uh, to get them you know, appropriate vaccination levels. Vaxis is also partnering with pharma companies on infection mimicry and new vaccines for herpes and prostate cancer and collaborating with MIT on HIV vaccines. The company plans to enter the clinic in early 2019. And as for life after the Harvard Life Lab, we're happy to call Massachusetts home. I think it's unmatched in terms of talent availability, uh, access to mentors, access to partnerships. It's really just a unique ecosystem we have here. And joining us now is the man behind the name of Paliuka, Harvard Life Lab, May Bain, Capital Managing Director and Co-Chairman Steve Paliuka. Welcome to Bloomberg Technology here in what is part of Harvard University. What made you fund the Life Lab that is the other key lab here? Well, it's a story that really started uh, several years ago uh, when I was running for Senate. Uh, one of my campaign promises was we'd really protect biotech here in, in life sciences. And I wrote an editorial saying, We've really got to not let that leave like technology left 20 years ago for Silicon Valley. We have a big lead. We have an infrastructure here, the best universities, the best hospitals. And that, that idea started five years ago. And I think through the vision of, of Dean Faust and Dean Nittnoria, uh, they came up with the idea of really building a facility that would allow these startups to, to stay here instead of leave, be cost effective, and, and try to grow companies. Were you worried about a, a brain drain? Where were you seeing it already potentially leaching to? Well, we had seen it uh, already in the tech industry. You know, yeah. back 25 years ago when I went to business school, uh, you know, we had digital equipment. The whole 128 had technology companies. Many of them got bought and went to California. We didn't want that to happen here. And so the mayor got involved, the governor was involved, two governors, and have really promoted the life sciences. And you can see the result of it now. And it sounds as though innovators and entrepreneurs are committed to remaining in the area as we're just hearing from that particular piece but what therefore in terms of competition when you're looking globally or you're looking in America are there areas that that you feel you can harness the crown away from or have to fight off I mean is the talent pool rich enough particularly in the United States when there is concern about immigration for example well I think the talent pool is probably the richest in the country here in the in the Boston Massachusetts area because of those universities because of the groundbreaking research because of the hospital complex and the technology we have here as well so we have the lead right now I think we have the crown I think we don't want to lose the crowd the crown and something like the life lab can really promote that it gives an easy access to companies. I think there's eight different schools from Harvard that have people in the Life Lab. Uh, there's 15 businesses already. We only opened up in November. Mm. 15 businesses, you've just seen one that's very exciting with vaccination, um, all sorts of projects going on. So when you have that kind of vitality, they can start here and then stay here and then move up to another facility after they, they have done their work at the Life Lab. I mean, you're a man who knows investing well, being at Bain Capital. is. Is biotech an area that you want? You would not only be wanting to see for future innovations for our own personal health, but also as, as a reward. Absolutely. Uh, there are many biotech funds, life sciences funds in the Boston area. We actually are, are just, uh, have just announced a large fund that's going to focus on that area, probably a little later stage than this. But uh, there's an ecosystem financially developed as well, so these companies can get angel capital and then move to venture capital and then move to private equity capital. The local ecosystem is supporting from a private point of view. What about from a public point of view? Because there has been much concern, particularly with the new administration in the White House, that perhaps we would see the taps turned off slightly for biotech funding. For now, that stay of execution is there, but what about longer term? Well, hopefully the White House will look at this and see it's good for America, it's good for the economy, and they certainly ran on that platform when, when they really get into the details on this. Secondly, uh, we've been really supported locally by our governor here and our mayor. The mayor was here at the opening. The mayor uh, and, and the entire administration of Boston helped get this, this facility up in record time. A lot of times these buildings take five to seven years, but due to the help of the governor, the mayor, the Biotechnology Council, Harvard University, Harvard Business School, and the community, it all came together very rapidly. And now you can see 15 businesses already up and running and starting. It's very exciting. What about the diversity? in terms of pool of people that you see here, females leading these sorts of businesses, ethnic minorities, is that something that you've been able to prioritize? A absolutely. Uh, my wife was heavily involved, uh, Judy was heavily involved. She's, she's a biotech investor. My daughter-in-law is, uh, is a co-founder of a biotech company. 
and, and they got together and worked with the university here to make it very family friendly. Uh, we have uh, rooms for women, rooms for birthing, rooms to bring kids, uh, uh, breastfeeding, uh, all the kinds of things, state of the art, that you can think of to make it a very friendly environment and a very easy environment to work for everyone. Fascinating. Well, I'm going to be digging into some of your investment theses and perhaps some of your love of sport as well. Steve Paliuka, of course, Bain Capital Managing Director, is going to be sticking with me. Much more ahead from our special coverage in Boston, of course. We're also broadcasting on Bloomberg Radio. That's 1200 AM and 94.5 FM HD2 in Boston. And Bloomberg is the official broadcast media partner and co-sponsor of the Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular. That, of course, on July the 4th. This is Bloomberg. We are live from the Harvard University Innovation Lab, showcasing the innovation, of course, as well as the diversity and the power of Boston's tech economy. Now, the city's status as a major tech hub could not have happened without the help of investment firms like Boston-based Bain Capital. It has global reach and approximately $75 billion in assets under management. So with me is none other than the managing director of Bain Capital and co-chairman Steve Paliuka. Paliuka is also the co-owner of the Boston Celtics. No wonder that you've got the shamrock on your tie today is the playoffs ahead but before we dive into the NBA I want to dive into some of your investment hypothesis at the moment as we see record low volatility in the United States as we're looking at stocks at record highs what about private equity in the areas that you're looking at well first of all prices are very high cyclically and we, and we know that uh, that's why Bain Capital we, we have tried to really be disciplined in times of the deals we do and secondly we're looking for what we'll call transformational opportunities uh, so for example Three of the companies we have in the portfolio, we bought two companies at once and put them together to form a stronger, more strategic, larger company on a global scale. So globalization, putting companies together, um, looking at areas that we know very well. We're, we're big into technology, into healthcare, industrial, consumer, uh, and we've had great success with that strategy of being disciplined. The great thing about private equity is it's not the stock market. You don't mark to market on a daily basis. You can take a long-term approach. And we try to find companies where we can invest to bring out new products, where we can, uh, again, find a way to take them global. And those are the opportunities we pursue. And those, in my view, are the only opportunities you can pursue in a market where prices are fairly high. Do you think you're going to see opportunities sparked by these high prices, whether we see more M&A and maybe then selling off of certain units? Or, I mean, at these sorts of lofty prices, would we ever see more pri public companies becoming private again? You know, it's, it's definitely an issue. When you pay a premium and the prices are already high, it's very difficult to make the numbers work in terms of private equity. But the world is large, and, I, and again, I think there is a role for private equity in these transformations. So there are companies that are, have kind of lost their way and need a restart. There are companies that uh, really need a different approach. There are companies where you really can transform by increasing the M&A process by taking them private. And so far, we've found plenty of those opportunities, and we've tried to be disciplined and try to do only the very best, and uh, so far, that's been a great result. Talking about transformational opportunities, let's bring it back to a bit of sport now, because it was theoretically a transformational opportunity when you took over Boston Celtics. It, it, it has been a process of reinvigorating, and now we're seeing that. What, what business opportunities did you apply to that to really see you now almost potentially in the run for champions? Well, it's been a, it's been a great labor of love. Uh, you know, Wick Grossbeck, our CEO, and Herb Grossbeck, who surfaced the opportunity that I was able to partner on with them, uh, really both came from a venture capital and operations perspective. So uh, we really came in with a strategic plan that involved three things. One, we wanted to build a championship team. That was the number one goal, and that brings fans and that brings excitement to the city. Uh, the second was we really wanted to improve the fan experience. Uh, the previous ownership had not invested in large jumbotron and not invested in things to get the players close to the fans and technology. All these technologies came online to get us closer to our customers. And the third was to make a community impact. So we formed the Boston Celtics Shamrock Foundation, and, uh, and that foundation has now become a leader in sports philanthropy. Putting all those three together and then finding a fantastic management team led by Wick, Danny Ainge, Rich Gotham, uh, just just incredible team uh, out there has led to a championship in, in 2008 and hopefully we're on the same path now. One amazing member of that team has caught the imagination. Isaiah Thomas, uh, of course, has been someone who's been eyed up and focused on. How hard is it, do you think, therefore, to withhold from offering him a longer-term contract? Is that something that you will be willing to do? Well, we don't talk about that, and, and Danny Ainge handles most of that, but I have to say, uh, 
Isaiah uh, Thomas has been a real profile in courage. I was able to go to the Profiles in Courage dinner on, on, on Sunday night and it reminded me, you look at Isaiah Thomas, uh, had a tragedy in his family, mm -hmm. uh, lost his teeth, and still playing for his teammates and his teammates playing for him, won the Chicago series with the team, and now battling a great Washington team. So it's been very inspirational for me personally and, and the, the entire Celtics family to watch Isaiah, you know, you know, fight through this and do it in such a professional and team-oriented way. It embodies everything that you think about the good things about the Celtics. And when you say you really have tried to foster the community and make also the fans so much more engaged. Many people are sometimes worried about perhaps certain NBA teams hogging some of the best players. How, how much does it affect the business of, of the NBA? Well, I think your objective is to try to get the best players. So, so there, I, don't, I think there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, and you've got a plan for that. Danny's done a fantastic job. He takes a five-year perspective in, in terms of trying to build a championship team. So we have salary cap space to get a free agent this summer. We have a very high draft choice. We're, we have the highest probability to get the first pick through a trade that, uh, that we that pull off. So the combination of, of getting young players, uh, getting free agents, and making beneficial trades, you know, can bring you a championship. And Danny seems to have found a great formula. And I think, again, stepping back, one of the keys to the Celtic success is we've really backed great folks. Uh, we've had the same folks in place almost longer than anybody in the NBA, yeah. and, and uh, it's, it's really paid dividends. So the patience has paid dividends. Steve Paniuka, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Good luck tonight been with great the players. To be here. Bain Capital and co-chairman Steve Paniuka. Much more from Boston coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde reporting from Boston all this week. And we are at Harvard University Innovation Lab, one of the newer buildings at this famous institution designed to help its students collaborate and potentially come up with breakthrough ideas. Now, just this week, it held its President's Innovation Challenge. More than 200 students, teams applied with their best ideas to solve social issues within the fields of health and life sciences. Winners focusing on problems as varied as HIV to personal bankruptcy took home up to $75,000 in prize money. Now, earlier, we sat down with Harvard President Drew Faust to discuss how this place fosters innovation. I think we have such a vibrant innovation community in so many dimensions here, and it's exciting to see it growing. It's exciting to see the output, and I think that having Mark Zuckerberg come back is going to be a great moment for everyone to celebrate him and to remind ourselves of the many ways in which we have been innovators and will continue to be innovators. Looking at one of the ways you're innovators is iLab. I mean, the very fact that you have accelerators here, ways in which you can help foster growing businesses and then set them out into the great world. How long has that been in play and how has it helped build new companies coming out of Harvard? Well, the iLab was founded in 2011 with the notion that providing people a space and some support in terms of experts in things like venture funding and building companies and bringing ideas into to the commercial world, that with that kind of help we could uh, enable students and faculty faculty to really follow their ideas and their dreams and make them tangible realities in the world. So it's turned out to be a success beyond even our fondest dreams as people have um, flocked to it. And we now have more than 75 companies that have come out of the iLab. And we have every year something called the President's Challenge, which mm -hmm. I sponsor. And students and groups of students compete for and some funding to move their idea to the next phase. And that's always really exciting to see the things that they've dreamed up and then to be able to pick some winners. You yourself are a historian by trade, if we use that turn of phrase. How do you feel the multidisciplinary focus of Harvard helps to foster this varied group of technology companies? Well, when I think about history and innovation, I do think they're very closely linked because I believe that understanding th that things have been different enables you to think that they can be different again. And if you just accept the status quo and don't understand what has led to the different paths that got you to the status quo, I think you're inhibited in your ability to figure out what paths might take our society and, and people within it in new directions 
happens in the future. So my sense, not just of history, which is my own field, obviously, but more generally, I think liberal arts and, and broad gauged education stimulate ideas. They challenge people to get out of their comfortable zones and to say, oh, if I just shift this perspective, what can I do differently? And we see this in the eye that many, many of the teams that come together draw on individuals from different schools, someone from the law school together with someone from the Kennedy School together with someone from the business school. They can think together about policy questions, regulation questions, organization questions, but maybe the product they're thinking about is a scientific project. So then someone from one of our science schools or departments will be part of that team. And so I believe that this wide-ranging approach enables people to think more um, ambitiously. We're almost talking about diversity here, aren't yes. we? Diversity yes. of discipline. What about diversity of ethnic origin? And of course, we both sat here as females, women, and particularly in engineering and coming into the eye labs, because this is something that particularly the tech giants struggling with is how to get enough women and diversity into their doors. Is this something that you think are coming through the ranks? Is STEM becoming more applicable across all sorts of parts of the world? We've seen a great growth in interest in STEM education here at Harvard over the last decade or so. Um, we established our School of Engineering as a school in its own right in 2007. And since that time, we've had a tripling in the number of students who want to concentrate major in that area, but a quadrupling in the number of women who have gone into to engineering. Uh, and that they make up about 35 percent of our engineering concentrators. Now, we think they should make up half, and we will keep striving for that. But I do think that this diversity relates to what you spoke about earlier, which is we've tried to say that engineering is a liberal arts field. Whatever you think you might be interested in, engineering could have a place in that. And in fact, if you're going to be a citizen of the 21st century, you need to understand technology. So we've tried to cast a very broad and open gate. And I feel that often in the past, science studies challenge people by saying kind of, if you're not going to be Einstein, you don't belong here, and we're going to flunk everybody out, and, and we're going to make it really impossible for you to succeed. We have a completely opposite attitude, which is, come, try this out. We want to give you a path to succeeding in this, because we think it's so important. So I think that has helped us a lot in diversifying the students who are interested in the field and participate in the field. And this extends beyond gender. It, I think it includes ethnicity as well. What about, therefore, pearls of wisdom that perhaps you've learned over the course of building up that diversity that you can give to business leaders that perhaps are still struggling and, and looking for ways in which to make sure their pool can be more diverse too? Well, I think rather than my giving pearls of wisdom, I think that we can learn a lot from each other. I think partnerships, as we um, seek to understand uh, how to nurture the kinds of attitudes and the kinds of career choices and pathways that make these attractive to students. So I think it's partly how we educate people and how we help them to understand what a career in science or technology could mean, but also how career opportunities are shaped, how uh, companies recruit, how they support individuals. So I would hope that we could have a lot of back and forth and collaboration about, about those shared commitments to, to diversifying the workforce. That was Drew Faust, president of Harvard University. Now let's check back in with our top story this hour. Snap reporting 8 million new users were added in the first quarter, falling below expectations. Shares tumbling more than 20% in after-hours trading. That's after wiping out about $6.5 billion in market cap. Now Snap CEO Evan Spiegel is speaking on the earnings call and commented about the interest in user growth. Ultimately, I think the way that we try to help people understand how we think about daily active user growth is really through the lens of uh, creativity and creation, because uh, we built our entire business on uh, creation. So one of the things I think we've talked about a lot is this idea that you know anytime someone creates a snap, you know they typically you know either send it to their friend, which brings that friend into the Snapchat ecosystem, or, or they add it to their story, uh, which obviously contributes uh, to time spent as they you know provide that content to, to, to all their friends. We'll be much more over that story throughout, but much more from Boston still to come as well. This is Bloomberg.
Now, the Harvard Innovation Lab, or iLab as it's known, is aiming to give its future innovators a leg up. Open to students across university, the lab offers a unique space for collaboration and education. A keystone initiative of the Harvard iLab is its Venture Incubation Programme. Now, every semester, teams apply to participate in the 12-week programme that combines mentorship, workshops and introductions to funding. That's to help move the startups further and faster. Select post-graduation teams move on to Harvard's Launch Lab. That's a co-working programme of funded alumni ventures. Now, we got an inside look at one of the companies in the programme. The Harvard iLab helps students grow their startups. Launched in 2011, it's a 12-week incubation program that combines mentorship, workshops and a connected networking community to move ventures further, faster. One of them is Shield AI. My combat experiences in Afghanistan led me to found Shield AI. And it was basically a recognition, which a lot of people have, a lot of combat veterans have, that technology could prove very useful on the battlefield if it was autonomous. Brandon Seng founded Shield AI in 2015. Headquartered in San Diego, California, Seng is earning his MBA from Harvard Business School. So this drone is different than the other drones that you see on the commercial markets today uh, because it doesn't require a pilot. So you see a lot of drones advertise themselves as autonomous drones. And what they're doing is they're following GPS waypoints. And so our drone does not require GPS to navigate. So using simultaneous localization and mapping, which are a lot of the same technologies you see in driverless cars, uh, it is able to navigate its environment and find these threats for the operators uh, outside about to conduct a clearance. The company has raised $10.5 million in funding. Harvard's network is incredibly powerful, and it allows you access to people with capital. And currently has contracts with the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security. But Shield AI exists in a fast-growing market with competitors. The global market for commercial applications of drone technology, estimated at about $2 billion in 2016, will balloon to as much as $127 billion by 2020, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers. Shield AI plans to deploy its first product later this year, when the mission is far from complete. Down the road, there are certainly other applications. Uh, search and rescue, law enforcement uh, are the first ones that come to mind, but there are other applications uh, that are interesting, but we're, we're really focused on our mission of uh, protecting service members and innocent civilians with these systems. Now with more on how Harvard's Innovation Labs are helping students and alumni launch startups, we're joined by Managing Director Jody Goldstein. Wonderful to have you with us, Jody. And we're just hearing about drones, but you've had, what, 800 incubated here under your tenure. What verticals are we seeing? What areas of specialization? Is there any sort of theme? Actually, the theme is diversity and breadth of ideas. I, it's so inspiring to me to see all, so many ventures coming up with new and novel ways to solve big problems in the world. Big problems in the world. Let's talk, therefore, about the diversity of that. Where are your students who are building these businesses coming from? Are they largely US-based or are they coming internationally? And is that in any way under risk under the current administration? Well, you know, it's really interesting. We're so fortunate to have the best and the brightest coming from all over the world to attend Harvard. We support all 13 Harvard schools. And um, students are coming together to the iLab to collaborate. And we nurture and support innovation. It's interesting that, of course, some of your better-known alumni, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill <laughs> Gates, dropped out because they had such good ideas. Is this almost a way of steering students to complete their studies and ensure that they can go on and get the growth potential and company ideas that they've already had? Yeah, well, our reason for existence is to nurture and support entrepreneurship and innovation in this one Harvard fashion. Um, but a natural happy byproduct of that is that students no longer need to drop out. It's actually better if they stay in school. The amount of resources and, I think most importantly, the community that they find here of like-minded entrepreneurs coming from a diversity of backgrounds and skills and interests, allowing them to meet around a shared passion, that's where innovation really happens. I know it's so hard to do when you've had 80, 800 children that you've helped like, grow through this, but are there any real success stories that outside of, of these hallowed walls we'd have heard of these companies already? I think you will soon, for sure. Um, we do focus uh, primarily on inputs rather than outputs. It's not 
based on financial success necessarily, but so many of our ventures are actually going out into the world and um, have a lot of traction and have raised a lot of money and are on, um, on their way to success. So we're super excited for them. I've actually heard of a couple. I think Handy is one that I already personally use. But what about, therefore, some of the pain points? You yourself are an entrepreneur. You are someone who sold many a business. What do you find the entrepreneurs come to you with most for guidance? Yeah, I mean, I think this idea of finding like-minded entrepreneurs, um, a supportive community uh, that sits alongside the academic curriculum, giving them an opportunity to uh, put their ideas to use, to practice, to iterate, to fail with no consequences. And if we can help them do that while they're still in school, get them further, faster, as you said, increase their likelihood of success by offering them access to resources, space, at, um, advisors, mentors, workshops, skill building, um, we really do think that we can put them out into the world uh, poised for success. Six years and you already got through 800, I'm sure you will. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been great having you here and thanks for hosting us as well. It's a great space to be in. Of course, that was Jody Goldstein, Managing Director of the Harvard Innovation Labs. Now coming up, robotics takes center stage here in Boston. We'll sit down with the CEO of iRobot, Colin Angle. That is, this is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde, and we are live from Boston all this week, showcasing the innovation, the disruption that the city's tech economy is bringing. Now, robotic companies are combining software, machine learning, and hardware technologies in one product. And one company doing just this is iRobot. Shares hit an all-time high after the company updated its outlook for 2017. Joining us now is iRobot CEO Colin Angle. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, many people know you for the Roomba, the, yes. the robot that helps clean up your, your floor at home. How much has the Boston ecosystem helped build the success story that we're seeing hit lofty heights when it comes to the share price? Well, the innovation required to go and create something as new as the Roomba uh, requires innovation, requires people with new ideas and access to uh, a, enough a, a body of, of talent to come in and go and create these in inventions. And so uh, the Boston educational system is second to none in the world, and we've been able to go harness uh, students coming out, and uh, here we are today. Harness new students, harness also new board members. And it's interesting, when you brought those board members on board, they were looking at Internet of Things, SaaS, we're looking mm -hmm. at software as a service. These were areas that you said, this is why you should have them on. Yes. What, therefore, next for my robot? Well, the smart home is becoming a very important thing. And as more and more things get connected in our home, we have to deal with the question of how do we organize and control it. And you might think that's an AI problem, but it's really not. It's the problem of understanding what's going on in the home so the house can do the right thing. What's the point of understanding the sentence, please go to the kitchen and get me a drink, if you don't know what the kitchen is? And so the role for iRobot uh, is not just to clean the home, but help the home understand itself so we can know what rooms are so that the smart home can actually be smart. And your home can be smart in the United States. You're helping do that. What about regional demand? Are you seeing any hot spots? Is Asia picking up? Where are you seeing demand for your products? So the, uh, the extraordinary growth that we're enjoying is, is broad-based. We're seeing uh, Europe uh, growth in Europe. Obviously, growth in China is fantastic. In Japan, one of the interesting things is one of our newest product launches, the, the Brava Jet, a uh, floor mopping robot, <laughs> is doing fantastic, um, particularly in Asia, where hard floors are actually far more common than here in the States. And so so that it's uh, grown to um, uh, outpacing uh, the growth rates of Roomba by significant margins in Asia. A mopping robot, get me one of them. Also, though, I'm thinking closer to my home, Europe, we have Dyson, which is a mm -hmm. private company. Quite often you need the space for the sort of R&D mm -hmm. to be private. You went public. 
yes. back in 2005, and there's been some activist investors that sometimes have questioned the R&D. How much have you been able to fend that off and, and commit to the development that you really need and the money you need to put into that? Well, I think that our the the success of our strategy is, is evident in, in uh, the success the company is enjoying, that we can't just invest to optimize for today. We need to go and come up with the technologies that are going to allow the next generation and, and the next generation to truly uh, differentiate ourselves from the competition. And so, uh, you know, doing that as a public company is possible if you uh, have investors who understand this, so that, um, uh, yes, we need to invest in R&D. We also need to develop a very exciting bottom line and a growth rate. And so it's a balance of things, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it can be successfully accomplished by attending to profitability, R&D, uh, and growth responsibly. You talked about the talent pool that is so well fed here in Boston yeah. from the academic institutions. You've also got offices, whether they be in London and in Asia. How are you talking to the institution? How much at the moment is the government perhaps affecting your business decisions here in the US when it comes to talent pool immigration? Is that affecting your business at all? You know, I think that it's something that we watch very carefully and we're concerned about. Thus far, um, you know, nothing has happened that would um, uh, dramatically impact our ability to operate. Certainly, uh, interna our international diversification is important. Uh, having engineering labs and capabilities uh, outside the United States is something that is interesting for us to ensure that we have access to the global talent pool that innovative companies truly require. Um, so far, so good, though. and. Um, uh, we we um, have the majority of our research and development uh, here in Boston and, and California. Well, it's been wonderful getting your in, insight and expertise as to what Boston has to offer you and indeed how we can all keep our homes a little bit tidier with the help of a robot or two. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. That was, of course, Colin Angle, CEO and co-founder of Robot, iRobot. Now that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Thursday's program, we'll be broadcasting from General Electric's temporary headquarters after breaking ground this week on a brand new complex in the heart of Boston. And we'll hear about the project from the CFO, Jeff Bornstein. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>